Come let us sing for joy to the Lord. Shout triumphantly to the rock of our salvation. Raise the roof for the rock who saved us. Let us come before him with thanksgiving. Let us shout triumphantly to him in a song. For the Lord is a great God, a great king above all gods. In his hand are the depths of the earth, and the mountain peaks are his. The sea is his, he made it. His, his hands, hands formed, formed the dry land. land. Come, let us bow down and worship. Come, let us worship and bow down. Let, let us, us kneel before the Lord. Let's kneel before the Lord, our Maker. For he is our God, and we are his people, and we are the people of his pasture. The sheep under his care. The vision. The vision. The vision. The vision. The vision is. The vision is Jesus. Good morning, Rising Church. First, let us remember why we are assembled right now. God is good. He is holy and deserving of our strength, soul, and mind. We are here to worship, and that means turning our attention toward Him. His glory, the love He chooses to give, and the result of that love, the world's salvation. Secondly, I want to let you know that we are planning to begin regathering on June 28th on the grass lawn outside of the church at 1030 for one service with everyone. Moving past that date, we will be inside the building, but going to two services and following the guidelines our health officials have set forth. There are a lot of details we're still working out, so please be watching your emails and Facebook group for information as we get things in place. This is no doubt good news and reason for celebration, but it is not why we worship. So as we begin our time together this morning, please keep your focus on the Lord and what He has to speak to our hearts today. Allow me to pray as we begin this morning. Lord God, I just thank you for this time, for this technology, for these avenues, Lord, that we can still gather and meet together in your presence. Lord, I pray for your love to captivate our minds and our hearts. Lord, I pray that as we are challenged to live as servants in this world, that God, we would take the call seriously to mirror Jesus, to be the vision of Jesus, both in, uh, in our hearts and in our minds, but also in our church and in our community at large. Lord God, you've given us a mission. You've given us great commands. And I pray that, Lord we, God, we would be sold out and all in on those things alone. Lord, we love you and we thank you for the bridge that you have made so that we can be in your presence today. Thank you so much for Jesus that has made this possible. Lord, we love you and we thank you. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. changing lives the best we have to 
just before this present season began, I was out to dinner with a few friends from another church at a fantastic pizza restaurant. We had sat down and ordered our drinks, and, and we were looking over the menu at the delicious options before us. And then all of a sudden, clang, boom, crash. Some of us looked up to see the obvious look of embarrassment on the waiter's face and witness his quick plunge to the floor to clean up the broken glass that now made the floor a hazard. Most of us would give each other a big-eyed look of, oh man, he's having a bad day, and go back to looking over the menu. But not one gentleman at our table. He didn't even look to see what had happened. As soon as he heard the sound, he jumped up out of his seat and went over to serve the servant we call waiter. Those weren't our drinks. This waiter wasn't someone that, that we knew. There was nothing to gain by jumping up. It's just the attitude, the posture of this man's life to be a servant of others, a servant of servants. There are a lot of things that I was reminded of and even taught in those few moments. But mostly there was this reminder of this is what the vision of Jesus looks like. It instantly reminded me of what Jesus did for his disciples before the Last Supper. On, on, in John chapter 13, verses 3 through 5, it says, Jesus knew that the Father had given everything into his hands, that he had come from God, and that he was going back to God. So he got up from, from supper, lay aside his outer clothing, took a towel, and tied it around himself. Next, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet and to dry them with the towel he tied around him. A lot of the ways that we apply this particular text is nice, um, but, but not really helpful or what Jesus had in mind when he was doing this. Many Christians have made it part of their special services uh, to have either their pastor wash their feet or the church uh, members wash one another's feet. And in some ways, uh, that, has, that has a lot of value, but it misses the point of what Jesus was demonstrating here. Put yourself in the shoes of one of the disciples there getting ready to eat a Passover meal. You've had a long day walking outside and, uh, in sandals on dirt roads. You get into the room and you're having lighthearted conversations with your closest friends. Feeling on top of the world, changing the lives of people, giving them hope where there was no hope. Miracles have happened. People have been comforted to the point of tears. But then an awkwardness settles in amongst you. Everyone's avoiding going to the table, looking busy, waiting for someone else to grab the towel and pour some water. Because surely I'm more respected than the lowest servant in the home. It's not my job. It's, this is an expected hospitality. Someone needs to serve me. Imagine seeing Jesus, your teacher, your Lord, Walk, around, walk toward the basin of water. He grabs a towel and wraps it around his waist and begins pouring the water. Ha ha, funny joke, Jesus. Nobody expects you to wash our feet, but he does. Now consider what Jesus had on his shoulders in that moment. He knows that this is his last meal. On this night, he is going to be arrested, and in a matter of hours, he's going to be tortured, humiliated, rejected by the crowds of people, betrayed, spat on, and executed on a cross in what is arguably the cruelest and most painful form of capital punishment to ever exist on earth. Jesus is carrying this. We have a habit of disconnecting the events of Jesus' life and compartmentalizing them, especially these last days on earth. And so when we imagine Jesus washing the disciples' feet, we don't see the brutality of the situation haunting his mind. We don't take into account that when he broke bread, he knew of the whip, the thorns, and the nails that would literally rip through his skin. When he poured the wine into the cup later that night, in his mind, he was watching the blood pour out of his own body. And if it were you or me, we would have skipped this meal. The anxiety from this kind of knowledge would be too great. We skip a weekly meeting with other Christians for much less. But in the midst of all of this, despite all that he was carrying, 
With every excuse Jesus could have given about what he had already done for them and what he was going to do, Jesus didn't just decide to serve. He was a servant of servants. We see this expressed in other parts of Scripture. Philippians 2, 6-8, through 8, Paul writes, "...who existing in the form of God did not consider equality with God as something to be exploited. Instead, he emptied himself by assuming the form of a servant, taking on the likeness of humanity." And when he had come as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even to death on a cross. John 6, 38, For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. Mark 10, 45, For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus was a servant of servants. He did not consider equality with God as something to be exploited. He he had freedom to act, but he didn't use it. Instead, he emptied himself by assuming the form of a servant. Jesus emptied himself by assuming the form of a servant, taking on the likeness of humanity, meaning he became or he altered himself to become like the other person he was serving And he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death. Jesus was a servant of servants. And as people who seek to be the vision of Jesus, we are to mirror his example. We too are servants of servants. Jesus told us to follow this example of washing each other's feet. In John chapter 13, verses 12 uh, through 15, he, he, writes, he says this, When Jesus had washed their, their feet and, and put on his outer clothing, he reclined again, and he said to them, Do you know what I have done for you? And I think we need to ask that question of ourselves. Do we know what Jesus had done in washing his disciples' feet? In verse 13, he continues, You call me teacher and Lord, and you are speaking rightly, since that is what I am. So if I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet... You also ought to wash one another's feet, for I have given you an example that you should also that you also should do just as I have done for you. Jesus was saying that we too, if we are going to claim Jesus as our King, Lord, and Savior, if we are going to be a part of the kingdom of God for the rest of eternity, he's saying that we should also become servants of servants. So what does a spiritual discipline of service look like? Well, it's a choice. We often equate our Christian service to particular jobs around the church building and the gathering. We hold doors open and we pass out bulletins. We might do some repairs or some upgrades. There are meetings to have and job uh, opportunities to fill. There are meals to prepare and events to decorate for. And that is definitely an aspect of being a servant. Those things are needed and appreciated. But what if there was no building? Jesus' example of service happens in a multitude of places, on a hillside, a well, by a tree, in homes around a meal, on a boat, in the water, on a cross, in front of crowds. Lots of times Jesus' serving uh, of others comes off as a spontaneous event. There were no newspaper ads or phone calls made. He didn't have have heralds announcing when he'd be at a particular place or messengers at his discretion telling people to assemble at a particular place. The same is true of the apostles after Jesus' ascension into heaven. They didn't just minister in synagogues and in different places. They went from home to home, Acts 2.42. They, well, Acts chapter 2. They went, uh, they went into places, they traveled to different cities. So being a servant doesn't revolve around a gathering or a building. Tony Evans wrote a book called Horizontal Jesus, and in it he sums up where service begins and when it ends in an easy-to-understand way, writing, Service begins with a humble attitude and includes actively looking out for the interests of others. You become a true servant when you come alongside others and help them improve spiritually, physically, emotionally, or circumstantially. You serve when your actions make someone else's life better. 
It happens in the home or in the car. It can happen in the workplace or in line at the store. It can happen in a restaurant when a waiter drops a tray of drinks on the floor. If we want to follow Jesus' example of being a servant of servants, we first have to look at where his focus was. Jesus' life revolved around two focal points. God, the Father, and other people. This reflects the greatest and second greatest commands of all Scripture. Matthew 22, verses 37 through 39 says, He said to them, Jesus said to them, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the greatest and most important command. The second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. You know who isn't the focus of all that Jesus does? Jesus. Time after time, you see Jesus emptying himself for others. And to re-energize, he gets filled up. And do you know where he goes? He retreats from the crowds and gets alone with God. This is an important pattern for us to recognize as we look at being servants in this world Many times we serve because it makes us feel good to serve. And I think you've probably felt that before. It's a wonderful benefit to serving another person, but it isn't the mark of a true servant. Because the focus is then on you and what you gain from the task. So you do this for your own glory. You do this for the reward of feeling good. A lot of people serve because they feel guilty or have been hurt and they're trying to numb those feelings. They feel unworthy and insignificant and service makes them feel like they have significance in the world or to their community. They desire status and attention so that they can, they can boast about how much good they do in their service. Or they're seeking to control and serve in order to manipulate and hold it over someone's head in order to cash it in again another day. No matter how effective and how much good their serving accomplishes, this is not genuine service that neither mirrors the heart of God nor the example of Jesus. This is service to massage the ego and calm the soul. And if you think about it, if a particular act of service doesn't seem to be something that, this, that you might particularly enjoy or something that you can use, then a lot of times we don't actually end up in engaging in service. So we, we see that, that we may be engaged in good acts, but we are not actually servants in a lot of cases, not servants of servants. We may reject this idea, we may, we may balk at that, you may be pushing back against that in your mind and in your heart, but consider the person who is kind to one of your friends, but unkind to everyone else. You wouldn't label this person a kind person. They show kindness sometimes. Neither would you look at Jesus' life and say, yeah, he did some good things. No, Jesus was the definition of a servant, someone whose focus is constantly on God and constantly on others and acts for their benefit. In fact, in Mark 9, 35, Jesus is having a conversation with the 12 disciples after they had been arguing about who is the greatest among them. And, and he point blank said, if anyone wants to be first, he must be last and servant of all. This is one difficulty to the idea of becoming a servant that we all struggle with. We have our ideals about who is worthy of our time and effort, but according to this statement made by Jesus himself, the greatest people serve everyone else. They don't pick and choose who they serve. And there is never a class of people who are above them or beneath them. True servants go into action whenever a need is recognized, whether that be physical, emotional, or spiritual. The fact is that becoming a servant of servants is a decision that we make. It, like any other discipline, uh, it, can, it can come naturally, but oftentimes it doesn't. And it's one of those things that we have to train ourselves in. One real barrier to choosing move, to move forward in serving, sometimes uh, to be a servant of servants, is the fear of being taken advantage of. Serving people generally means that there are those that will take all that you have to give, criticize it, and then ask for even more. But this is important that you recognize your motivation and your choice in the matter. If you choose to serve occasionally, You'll become jaded quickly, and you'll stop serving altogether. 
We walk away saying, I did this out of the goodness of my heart, and they walked all over it. Check your motivation. The motive was to be a good person. You know that the Bible doesn't call you a good person, right? There is no good person. Only God is good. All have fallen short of the glory of God. There has never been a righteous person on earth except for Jesus. And this is not to be said to destroy your self-esteem, but to communicate truth and that you are finite and that your resources are finite, including the goodness of your heart. When the motivation to serve is bigger than you, say maybe for the kingdom of God and the glory of Christ. You serve even those who may take advantage of you because it's no longer you who is in charge. If you live for the kingdom, you live under a king who works all things together for his glory and has purposed you for good works. Ephesians 2.10, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared ahead of time for us to do. So you serving this particular person over and over and feeling taken advantage of is probably a relationship that God has ordained for you to speak the truth of God that results in their transformation and rescue from death. When we make the decision to become a servant, we live by that principle without abandon. We are effectively giving up control. When we're in charge, we worry about who's going to take advantage of us, who's going to step all over us. But when we choose to be a servant of the king and anyone he sends into our lives, we're not in charge. And each time we get stepped on, we know it's somehow going to work out to heaven's advantage. Take any of your favorite people in scripture who, hasn't, who wasn't stepped on in service of the Lord God. Paul had a constant thorn in his side. He was beaten and imprisoned multiple times. Joseph endured decades of hardship and setbacks. Moses was stepped on over and over again by God's people. And Jesus, the ultimate servant, was beaten, betrayed, and crucified. So what is the point of the discipline of service? Sounds kind of like a raw deal, doesn't it? Well, it's not to serve because we are Christians. That's not the point. We engage in the discipline of service. We force ourselves. We train ourselves. We beat our bodies into submission as the Apostle Paul would encourage us to do by his own example. We gain from service because it, it serves to humble us. When we decide to make service a part of who we are and become a servant of servants, we have to put aside many desires that rise up in us. It's only when we wage war against those things that we realize how tight of a grip they have on us, recognizing that we're not in complete control of our own mind, body, and emotions. And that is an incredibly tough reality. It forces us into the arms of the Father over and over because we are powerless to transform our deepest wants and desires. It's there that we experience real transformation of the heart, that our salvation gets worked out with fear and trembling. Second, it introduces us to the good of real suffering. We don't like pain. We don't like to be taken advantage of. We want to be respected and we want to be told that, that we're doing all right and that we are significant. But to willingly be stepped on and to give up control of our own life costs us something. To serve and never be recognized for it is not only humbling, it's painful. But as we learn to embrace this pain, we see the value of willingly giving up our own way for the ways of the Lord. We see the good that can be accomplished through willingly choosing to be afflicted. As we serve others and, and pursue their good, we are transformed by the work that God has given us to do and by the very heart of God himself. Not only does somebody else get to hear the good news and to have their needs met, but we too come face to face with God 
giving him our pain, giving him our suffering, and he responds by changing our heart, our mind, our soul. We see the good that can be accomplished in all lives through willingly choosing to be afflicted in this way. Third, we gain by serving the fact that the church becomes a place where needs are met and hope is offered. I myself cannot serve and meet the need of every individual that attends Rising Church. It's also not the way that God intended the church to operate. We are each charged with the responsibility to be a servant of servants. And if we take that call seriously, then everyone's needs get met. There is a greater opportunity then to learn from one another. There are chances for relationships to develop as we go to and from each other's homes. Phone calls and messages are being sent to one another throughout the week, checking in, encouraging, and holding each other accountable. I mean, can you imagine if everyone in Rising Church was on the lookout for, for needs and then acted on them of their own accord? It would be a pretty phenomenal thing to see. It's my hope that you'll consider what it means to look out for another's interests before your own, for the glory of God, especially as we consider gathering together in person again soon. This is the way of Jesus, to be a servant of servants. I cast my mind to Calvary where Jesus bled I see his wounds, his hands, his feet, my Savior on that cursed tree. His body bound and drenched in tears, they laid him down in Joseph's tomb.
Each and every Sunday, we take a few minutes to meet around the Lord's table in remembrance of Jesus. This practice is important to us as followers of Christ because it calls to mind, in a physical way, the sacrifice that Jesus made on the cross for our sins. At the last meal Jesus had before he was crucified, he took bread and he broke it and he said, this is my body that is broken for you. When we eat the bread, we remember that Jesus bore the wrath that we deserved as a result of our decision to sin. Then Jesus took a cup of wine and asked his disciples to drink it, remembering the new covenant of grace bought with his blood, which signified his life that was willingly given in our place and also represents our hope of eternal life by his resurrection from the dead. We take this time to remember and honor Jesus for being our Savior, dying in our place and giving us new life in God's grace and kingdom. So as you prepare... Take a moment to pray, to worship God, thanking Him for all that He has done for us in His mercy, grace, and goodness. If you are a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, I just invite you at this time to participate and partake in the emblems of communion.
Rising Church, as we close out this morning, remember that the Lord is good and worthy of us laying down our lives to be a servant of servants. We take joy in doing this because it is what Jesus has done for us. Because he was a servant, we can enjoy relationship with the Lord and with one another. Thank you for worshiping together today. Go in peace, my friends, and always remember, the vision is Jesus.